So I am an engineer. It is 7 a.m. and I am knocking on someone's door with a giant bag full of empty bottles. Now I drove 12 hours yesterday to get here and I'm gonna drive another 12 hours back tomorrow with a carload of now full bottles. Samples. 7 a.m., 8, 9, 10 a.m., knocking on doors with bags full of empty bottles. Someone answers the door and they're apologizing to me for their breath and their hair. They haven't been able to use their water since last night because that's what's required for the sampling. So now they haven't showered, they haven't brushed their teeth, they haven't flushed their toilet since last night. These are the sacrifices they've made to participate, to get their water tested. And now they're taking me into their basement and they're apologizing for the mess in their house as we go to look at their pipes. But the pipes and the water, that's the mess we're investigating. I'm a writer. It's 5 p.m. and we're heading up a neighborhood street. We're headed to pick up a kit with three bottles, sampling instructions. We're trying to get as many kits as we can into the van because tomorrow we're gonna head back 12 hours to Virginia to see what's in the water. We have been sampling for two days straight. We are sweating our butts off in the August Midwestern heat. I mean, we got sweat in all crevices. <laughs> And we go up to a porch, we knock on the door. A young woman answers, hola, she says. Hola, I say back. Me llamo Cassandra, y es Sid y Catherine. Y estamos aquí por el agua. And she says, oh, sí, sí, botellas de agua. Un momentito, por favor. So she heads in to get the kit. Meanwhile, these two cute kids come out of the porch, and they're curious about us, and we're curious about them. And she comes back with the kit, I hand it off, and before we head away, I stop and ask her, Usted tiene alguna pregunta para nosotros? Do you have questions for us? No, no, está bien, gracias. <laughs> I was relieved, no questions. Because not only was my Spanish rusty, <laughs> uh, but you never know what you're gonna get for questions. You know, and you never know if you're actually gonna be able to answer some of the questions that you might get. So, at that point, I just thought, you know, th this is great. And, but then at the same time, we started to leave, and I paused. And I waited, and I thought, wait a minute. No questions? Really? Ninguna? Verdad? So here in Cicero and Berwyn, these, these suburbs of Chicago, our sampling found that the law wasn't broken. That's good news, right? But when we sampled, not enough homes had high lead, but it was so close. It was just on the edge of breaking the law. What does this mean for the people in Cicero and Berwyn? And what does this mean for you and me in towns that are in compliance with the law? Well, we can't always answer these questions, but here in Cicero and Berwyn, we are realistically hopeful. So here, the EPA has issued violations. Now these are violations about how the samples were taken, not the levels of lead themselves, but that's good. And our community partners have meetings set up with the EPA. This is progress. This is good news. Now as engineers and scientists working with communities, we can, we can provide samples, we can provide technical advice, and even sometimes go to the meetings with our partners. But we're also people. And as people working in communities, we wait with these residents and we hope. So uh, three years ago, almost to the week, in fact, I was on another porch in Flint, Michigan. And at the time, uh, I was watching another young mom who's now a well-known activist, Leanne Walters, answer questions and address concerns of a mom who stood at the threshold 
holding her infant while her other young child ran behind her. And Lee just stood there and, and pleaded with her, please, please don't use the water coming into your home anymore. Please just use the bottles that we brought you. And I promise you we'll bring more. And if you know Lee, she's not kidding. Like, she will, she'll be back. Um, and at the time, I had actually gone to Flint with the Virginia Tech team to document and report what was going on on the ground. And while we were there, we felt this sense of urgency because at the time, we were there to retest the water to see if it was improving. And citizens there wanted to know if that was the case. We wanted to know if that was the case. So while I was there feeling this urgency, I actually dropped my notebook and my pen and I picked up the water containers. And I helped try to get as many of those in those vans as possible. And in the process, working with that community, we, we felt those water containers turn into something well beyond just containers for water. They were roadmaps towards safety and security. They were tangible pieces of home. Home. Each bottle, each sample is someone's home. After we got the results back for Cicero and Berwyn, we sat down together as a team and we called the homes with the worst results. We called people like the Reverend Diane Johnson. We tested the water in her home and we found high lead. We tested the water in her church and we found lead. She had her blood tested and she found lead. Nothing prepares you for this. Nothing prepares you for this, this feeling of intense calm. When you have to call someone and tell them that the water they've been drinking could be poisoning them. Now, I imagine this might feel like a doctor telling someone that they have cancer. And for me, it was this moment that I realized Diane can't drive home tomorrow like I can. She can't leave. Here in Cicero and Berwyn and these communities, our science is their real life. So I came home from that trip originally in Flint and I was working at a life sciences institute at the time um, as a science communicator. And the director of the institute asked me, How, how'd the trip go? And I said, game changing. That was the first thing that came out of my mouth, didn't even think about it, just game changing. And I didn't really know what that meant at the time. And to be honest with you, I really don't know now. Um, but what I can tell you is that I knew something was gonna change, and sure enough, a year ago, I quit that job. And a year ago, I sat at a desk in Washington, D.C. I was a research fellow at the EPA. I did Homeland Security research. I investigated how to clean up water after a terrorist attack. This research was so important. It was vital. But it was also research that I hoped and I prayed no one would ever need. Do you know what it feels like to do work you hope never gets used? Now, now I'm a PhD student here at Virginia Tech and I do research I hope anyone can use. Now I buy test kits off of Amazon and I test real people's water. Now I do research that is important to people's everyday lives. So then I'm back on this porch in Chicago and I'm wondering, does she have concerns about her water that we have now in a box to take back to Virginia? Did she know to even wait six hours before collecting the water, before using the water? Does she have any, any idea of, of why she's participating? Or did she just agree because she's the friend of a friend of a neighbor who's part of this academic citizen partnership? And I started to wonder, standing there, what exactly is my responsibility in this situation? And how can I contribute to the conversation here? So now I've chosen to do a PhD in English 
because it allows me to ask questions about how science works with our everyday lives, how it contributes to who we are, how we see ourselves as people, as parents, as friends. And it allows us to ask questions about language and how we tell stories, how we tell stories as scientists, as journalists, as friends, as neighbors, and how those stories in turn impact policy and people. And I choose to do this work because at the end of the day, I care. For me, it all comes down to love. It was science that, in some of my darkest and hardest times, inspired me and gave me hope. And now, now I get to love people through science. Now, I'm not perfect at it, and our team isn't either, but in each of these communities that we work with, we try to learn from the people that we work with. And the whole time, we get to help provide them data that lets them answer their own questions and fight their own battles. Lead is silent. We don't know it's in the water just by looking at it. But we know it's a problem in cities around the country. In cities like Cicero and Berwyn, where there are real people with pasts and presents and futures. People like Diane Johnson, who told me that she drank the water for 37 years. And that whole time, she bragged about how amazing their water was, because it comes from Lake Michigan, one of the best sources of fresh water in the world. And for 37 years, she drank water that was introducing lead into her body. So communities like Cicero and Berwyn, these two suburbs of Chicago we've been talking about, they were required to use lead service lines until 1986 when they were banned, which means that a staggering 95% of homes in Berwyn have lead service lines. I am an engineer. I'm a writer. I have a unique privilege to take these experiences with me back to the lab as I try to answer new questions and help in new ways. And I have a unique privilege and I argue responsibility to go to other communities and work with them to ask questions about how things are the way they are and why. Every bottle, every sample is someone's home. Every sample is a story. A story of change. A story of home. A story of love. Thank you.